No, no, no. Here, you go there. I'll go here. I'll sit on there. Um, yeah, I can't I be in the, 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 the house. Like right. <laughs> we actually have a bunch more. Um, 
No, I think it's, uh, it's nobody. Okay, okay. So we started out at Foster, and then we ended up at Civic Business Club and Tech Street. That was Civic Business Club, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's mm -hmm. awesome. That's yeah. great. Civic Business. So we moved there, and we went to Switch Yard Historical Place downtown, mm -hmm. and then we did Facet Gallery outside. Mm -hmm. Lots of you guys came to Facet Gallery, and then we had one show at White Space Gallery. Right. With Greg. yeah, with Gregory. Yeah, you were our last guest. The whole world came to. Um, <laughs> so here we are. Several, you know, online Zoom uh, talks, and we had those IGTV like daily talks. Mm -hmm. We had so many things happen, but and then just trying to keep our community together. And you guys are, while we do this, uh, really creative, really love <coughs> this idea. Um, and then yeah, here we are. So all right, I'm gonna speed up. I'm gonna get into it. Uh, I do want to thank our sponsors. Uh, we have three sponsors down here at Fast Enough. We've got KEH. They are, let me get this right, the largest dealer seller of used camera equipment in the world. Yeah. Yes. Woo. In wow. Atlanta. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> but if you buy their stuff, it's great. It's bargain. It ain't, it ain't bargain material. It's really good stuff. So, they're, they're mm -hmm. great people. Uh, and we've got EPR with Carlos. Woo. Oh, Woo. If you've done any photography work in this city in the past, like, 30 years, you know about <laughs> EPR really well. Rent equipment to go studio with that, to go PR pitch, uh, mm -hmm. to provide it all around the store for us. So uh, thank you guys for being there. And I think thanks to our language learners, we actually have photos, but they have donated two bags, and I wanted to use lovely pictures of this bag for them. Woo -hoo. It's nice to rent them. Uh, <laughs> and then all the lovely folks on the internet, because we did a live stream, uh, we're going to use one as well. So, yeah. so I think that is all of my housekeeping notes. Did I uh, cover it all? If I didn't, Oh yeah, the bathroom's back here. <laughs> when we go do a real live stream. <laughs> <laughs> so we have drink uh, over here. Bug spray. The, the live stream's loving it so. All right. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna hand it over to Ray. Introduce our panel. So thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Oh, and I'm Kevin Lyle. And this is Ray Jones. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, welcome again, everybody. If you're watching from home, awesome. That's that's great. We wanted to keep it small. Obviously, this is the first one back since, like you said, January 2020. So um, it's a big step, and we were we've been trying to figure it out and talk about how to do it right and wait for the right time. And every month we were kind of just, you know, trying to, like everyone else, we're trying to figure it out. So um, it's really just amazing to to see people together. You know, a lot of familiar faces, new faces. Really, really, um, really amazing. But so. Um, I want to thank some, some of the people that helped. Jen Finch is uh, shooting pictures over here. She's going to be moving around. If you want to take your own pictures, please uh, just move around as much as you want. Every, literally, almost everybody here is a photographer, so you can't, you can't really, uh, <laughs> no one's going to be weird now. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's kind of weird. That's, weird. that's John, so that's just what he does. Um, John Hijack, uh, helping out a lot. Andrew, my friend Andrew back here in the back, is running the live stream. Um, I see John Melak back there supervising. Thank
2018? 2018, mm -hmm. so maybe like three years ago at this point was um, a guest speaker at Lynn right. Um <laughs> And then, so yeah, we've been, we, Kevin and I like kind of have this ongoing list and we're, we're kind of always trying to meet new people and Lindsay was, you know, one of our, our people that was on our list for a while and finally got her in. But anyway, she's here again tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, Martha Williams is, is next and Martha is the visuals director at Atlanta Magazine. So um, Atlanta Magazine is the coolest editorial magazine in Atlanta. If you're a photographer, if you're a photographer they um, really uh, respect photography, they use it well, and that's thanks to people like Martha and the other art directors, creative directors there who um, really use photography well. So, we appreciate you. I know you've hired probably half the people, maybe out here, maybe not half, but we've worked for you, so thank you. Um, to our right is Gregory Harris, who just uh, leapfrogged up to curator up at the High Museum, curator of photography, sorry, curator of photography. Um, and you've been there for, since how long? Five years. So five years, and um, you know, and now it's like the head curator. He's the guy. Guy. The guy at the high. Yeah. Ah. I mean, seriously, if you've been to the, to the high in the past five years to see a photo show, you know, that's thanks in part to, to Greg. So um, amazing. Thank you for your work as well. So um, I really, we really want this to be a, a discussion. You know, if you've been here before, it's, you know, there's no rules. You don't have to wait. It's ask as you go. And we're going to try to pass the mic around, not so much because they can't hear you, but for the live stream people. Um, audio goes through there, so if we don't talk to the mic, they're not going to hear what we say, so let's try to um, stay on top of that. We got Andrew back here, and then John's watching the audio, so um, I'm going to not call it anybody. I'm just going to put it out there and see who's <laughs> eager, but I want to know, um, like, if you had to describe where we are now, so it's, it's June 20. I guess I want to know, like, like what's your what's your outlook? What's your finger on the pulse? Is it is it positive? Is it is it is it? Are we still in a dark hole? And this is you know, there's no right or wrong answer, and it's going to be different for each of you. But um, I want to start there, and then guys jump in. Okay, who's going? I think we're in the positive. <laughs> I mean, I feel like sorry. I don't know who this. Um, yeah, it's been hard with the pandemic, but um, things are opening up. There's more opportunities, and lots of people are vaccinated, so I feel like things are starting to speed up again, for better or worse. Uh, whoa, hey. Well, in in the in the entertainment business, it's uh, full speed ahead. So, if you're in that business, it's um, time to raise your prices because we can't find photographers. Yeah. Oddly, it's this mic is really good. It's picking up everything. Um, no, I think in general, though, I mean, I don't have my finger on the pulse of much outside of the entertainment business, but certainly in the entertainment business, full speed ahead, can't find a photographer to save your life. You got to call 25 people to find somebody to work. It is absolutely competitive and people are raising their prices and getting paid more. Um, so it's a good time to be in that business. Outside of that business, I think it's a great time to be a storyteller and to be a photographer in general, whether or not, you know, you're always getting paid what you're worth or getting the work you want or getting as much work as you want. I don't know, but I think in general, there's so much going on in the world. It's a great time to be a visual storyteller. I, I have to agree with that from, um, from the way things just kind of shifted most of last year. Um, you're definitely seeing like this this new class of photographers that are showing up as well um, but at the same time if you were on the cusp of being established um, if you were well, let me put it like this if you were behind that cusp it's just a twinge harder if you don't already know anybody 
So I think, you know, with, with that comes um, some hesitation to hire photographers. You know, if you if you are just starting out, um, you definitely want you, you don't want anybody to feel like you're taking advantage of them. You want to see how their skills kind of grow before you really start to take them in to, um, you know, be a photographer uh, for a certain, you know, Warner. Who are you again? <laughs> <laughs> because when I shot there it was Time War no Warner Media. So mm -hmm. yeah. with them, yeah. But you know, even then, I had to. I feel like a lot of us have to really earn our stripes before we get to that point. So I could see why it would be hard to find somebody, mm -hmm. you know, in the midst of things opening up because now you have this, this greater class of people, but it's like, you're not ready yet. You're almost there. Mm -hmm. You're still, you know, working really hard. You're, you're gone most of the time. So mm -hmm. I could see why it would be a bit difficult to, to find somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the other thing is, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the other thing is, um, um, our budgets got slashed last mm -hmm. year, but we haven't, they haven't changed our budget. So until, you know, later in the, in, later this year. So we're working with last year's budget that got cut. So, you know, all the creative directors, at least from in sports, we're, we're doing what we can and trying to hire the best people with the budget that we have. Yeah. So it's like, we're just making do, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic. Um, sports is, it feels like sports is, almost back to normal almost every city is uh um has opened up all their all their stadiums and venues to full capacity so i'm very optimistic and uh, <laughs> yeah exactly Let's go Hawks. <laughs> that's right I think the pandemic showed us that there there are so many other ways to communicate with people, yeah. and I did. You know, it was quiet for a long time, but I did more studio visits during the pandemic than I did in normal times, because people who, you know, wouldn't say, you know, wouldn't feel comfortable saying like, come over to my studio, or they live in another city, you know, they would shoot me an email and say, like, can we can we figure out a time to to get together? We, you know, hmm. spend an hour on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And it was really, I mean, it was different because you're not there, you're not looking at the work, you don't have that same kind of in-person engagement. But, you know, you can connect with people, you know, presumably all over the world. So it, I think it, it took down that barrier of like everything that we do always has to be in person. And I think, you know, as someone who deals with, with objects and like my goal is to get people to come and see the object in person, that's always going to be you know, the, the, the primary experience, but there's a lot that you can learn from just having a conversation with someone through Zoom. And I probably would never have accepted one of those invitations previously, but because I had no other choice, I was like, let's, let's do it, let's give it a shot. And it works surprisingly well. I actually like the new format of, <laughs> of portfolio reviews. I don't have to leave my house. <laughs> I mean, not, like the, the cost efficiency, because if you think about photographers, yeah, we may, make enough but we don't want to always leave from our city in case we have to work and especially now like it was as a ease of process to say i want to schedule these meetings on this day and that way it won't interfere with me going to shoot the next day mm. so like the i did one with jp and then um it was it just felt more comfortable and i feel like a lot of other photographers that i've talked to felt better doing it in a Zoom format because um, you're in the comfort of your home. You, you don't have to travel with a book. You don't have to leave the state or you know whatever the case may be. You had other options rather than just one or two big you know, portfolio, portfolio reviews throughout the year. And I've also, I noticed how the um, photo community pulled together, and especially groups like APA and ASMP and a few other people, a uh, few other groups who had some at a very affordable price because, you know, portfolio reviews can be really, really, really expensive. Um, and also, if you were doing it for the first time, it made you feel better about it because you didn't have to leave out of, some, of, of a comfortable space. So, you know, just, just like you were saying, it was just easier to meet more people 
in a certain amount of time and then you know you didn't you, even though you didn't have that tactile or that touch you were still able to at least see how people felt about the work that they were showing you in that time you can have a conversation that you would never otherwise have. exactly exactly i agree i agree any questions while we're in sort of a little spot um yeah question or no? yeah. okay i'm gonna try to Okay, I'll yeah. go with um, So we get very limited time with the, with the, with the players to, to begin with, and now we have no time with them. So mm -hmm. it's like we're making do with what we have uh, for photo and video content, and we're recycling stuff that we got back in spring um, when, when they had very strict um, you know, COVID protocols, and Kevin was um, a tier one or a tier two, tier two, and they have di they give um, different, you know, access to different tiers. So Kevin was fortunate, or you know, was one of the cho lucky chosen ones that got <laughs> tier two. So he was able to get you know get close to the players, and um, you know it's crazy because spring training is when we shoot all of the content with our players for to use throughout the entire year. So that these are all the photos, all the video content that we put on social and digital. And um, you know, usually there's a whole army of people who's, who's producing all this. This year we had maybe two video people and Kevin. And so mm -hmm. Kevin didn't, wasn't even allowed to have an assistant, so he had to set everything up. And it was, it was, it was amazing that he was able to you know, shoot all this and get all the stuff that we got. And we're using that and we're like trying to be creative and inventive and see how we can re, you know reuse or repurpose some of this stuff so that it doesn't so that it looks fresh um, so um, I guess what we learned about coming out of this is you know maybe we don't need a whole army of people down there maybe we can be a, a little bit more efficient <laughs> you still need an assistant you still need an assistant but um, but I think that um, it's just I think everyone the takeaway from from a lot of people in sports is um, you know, let's be more efficient. Let's let's be more creative and inventive and find new ways to solve problems. That's good. Being creative and inventive is always good. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the balance? Coming from like an agent, you know, what is the balance though of finding more efficiencies but also advocating for the artists you're working for? Because I find that we, we tend to have to strip down our artists more and more lately and offer, you know, less and less when we know what it takes to get a really great production, when mm -hmm. we know what we need to be supported. Yeah. So where is the line of, like, accepting new budgets, accepting there's a new way of doing things, but then also advocating for the artists we're working with? That could be for, <laughs> you know, uh, Well, I mean, you know, I remember one shoot, John in the back is one of our staff photographers, and he, he literally shot a portrait job by himself, was the digital tech, the assistant, the photographer, and I mean, it was a, uh, wow, now his name is escaping me, NBA player, Blake Griffin. Um, but you know, like that's, that, that's obviously way too much, and it's just a, an extreme example, but that was back during the height of the pandemic. To me, that's all, that's all gonna come back, all the assistants and the digital techs and the, creative directors on set and the hair and makeup people that's all coming back it has to because you can't expect that to be the new normal and um, those people are all necessary parts of the puzzle and they support the photographer they support the creative process and I know from a creative standpoint <clears throat> you know it's been really tough for our creative director and us as photo editors to oversee photo shoots from 500, 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles away. It's, it's frustrating, but oftentimes you probably don't get the best results. Um, we're still getting great results because we're hiring great photographers with, you know, who execute 
as good as they can in that situation. But yeah, I think could you get a better result with the creative director on set and not zoomed in from 2,000 miles away? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's t I mean, it's time for that stuff to come back. <laughs> and hopefully it will slowly but surely, you know. That's my. I think the balance. I think I think the balance is. Um, it's like you got to let the creators create and not have them focus on, the little things like you know, like is the backdrop going to fall down or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it's tough because um, you know, for you know for us we have a budget and you know I control the budget. I, I have a budget that I have to hit. I can't go over that. So I'm trying my best to, to um, you know, with the, with the limited amount that I have, but I also understand that I'm not gonna get the best, you know, images if I don't spend, if I don't put money into it. So it's like, it's, it's a tough place to be because I've got to figure out, okay, like, you know, is it worth spending here or is it worth cutting here? So it's a tough nut to crack. I'll just piggyback real quick. I do think you, you mentioned inventive and creative, and I do think that it's always a good exercise to sort of re-examine the way you do yeah. things. So it's not impossible to do things with less. You know, you just have to get inventive and creative, and that's, that's a worthwhile thing, no matter what you're doing. Yeah. But I think if you started out with less, then <laughs> when you get more, it's kind of like, because uh, lately, all of my sets have been really, really small. Like, you know, just because of COVID and, um, and honestly, that's just what I'm used to because I'm used to being the photographer, the digitech, the lighting, uh, grip, everything that comes with it. Sometimes, you know, I may play hairstylist, but, um, you know, I, I, I think it really just depends on, on the, on the artist. And I think if they're able to adapt to that, you know, especially if not only because you want the job, but you want the experience, then you'll. You just kind of roll with the punches. But I, I understand what you're saying, like advocating for us because we want to do the best job in order to get the next job. And, um, and I've been on plenty of shoots lately where I have had to zoom in with the creative director and we're using Capture One to show, you know, the images as they're coming in. It's a, it's a good solution, but it's not the best solution. So, so yeah, advocating for us and wanting to have everything in place for all of you because you know we want to keep being hired or you know potentially be in the museum, so uh, <laughs> you know just 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 making sure that when we get back to um, some some sense of whatever the new norm is going to look like, that we do have everything in place in order to be successful. Because you know we really like what we do and want to make sure that we we do it well every time. I mean, I'm coming at this from a from a slightly different perspective. But museums have spent the last year really reckoning with, like, what is our role in the community? Who is our audience? Who is our constituency? And, um, and we've been, you know, really, sh you know, doing a lot of work to try to figure out, you know, who, who do we, who do we want to represent? What, what's the voice we want to have in the community? What's the platform we want to give to artists? And how do we want to engage with our audiences? And as a, as a curator, I work a lot with you know, contemporary living photographers and something that I've been thinking about is how you know, when we put together a show there are a lot of expenses that come along with that and when we're talking about equity it's, it's a big question that we're, we're asking like what does equity look like in the context of a museum like one aspect that I have a degree of input over is how you know when, it, when you know when we put something on a wall it doesn't it's not like it just appears there like someone has to print it someone has to mount it someone has to frame it and that often costs a lot um, or if they're making new work, like we need to make sure that you know an artist is supported to make to make that work. And we can't just say like, well, we're going to give you this great opportunity, and it's an honor to have your work on the walls of the High Museum, so you pay all the bills. And we have a mixed history of, of dealing with that. Sometimes, like certain artists are willing to pick up that that tab, or they have the means to do it, and others don't. And so they may miss out on an opportunity, they may cut corners, they may not be able to like fully realize the vision that they have as an artist. And we, you know, and so they, you know, there's compromises you make all the time, but making sure that, the, you know, the museum is not putting an undue burden on the artist for, you know, the, the privilege of showing at the High Museum. So that's something that I've been working a lot on is figuring out, like, how can we structure our budgets so that the artists that we show feel that they're fully supported and it's not a burden for them to exhibit at the museum. And that's something that's, that's really important 
to me that it's like, yeah, exposure is great, and I'm like, you know, I'm sure it's, it's going to boost your career, but you know, you can't you can't pay your rent with exposure, so <laughs> you know, you should you, you shouldn't you shouldn't you shouldn't have to go in debt or max out your credit card, you know, just for the privilege of having a show at the High Museum. my question is sort of an open-ended thought is um, where are we with uh, with dealing with that you know we've seen this um, cultural you know upheaval turning uh, everything's changing in, in all of our sort of social all of the areas of our lives whether it's like the me too movement with you know actors and musicians or whether it's um, you know it seems like it's kind of like flowing through each of uh, these genres of creative work, not just creative work, but, um, you know, are we at a better place? Are we getting there? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this age old question of should, you know, should a photographer do work for free? Um, a lot of, you, no. you could ask 10 people, you get 10 different answers. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> never, never work for free. I, yeah. So please, yes. I mean, I feel like most of my job is advocating for photographers mm -hmm. like I am a photographer too like I am in a place I, I, my entire career I've only dealt with budget cuts I've no one's ever said I'm raising your budget <laughs> mm -hmm. you know it has been shrinking my entire career we are in like the twilight of the editorial <laughs> world sadly like print media is in a crisis mm -hmm. in you know but like I would gladly like shoot a hundred objects on white so that I can like pay Lindsay more money for like a, a job. You know what I mean? So like I, but like, I don't know if there'll be photo editors anymore, you know, like the, but I do think that our job, part of our job is advocating for like a good, uh, for equity, for paying people what they're worth and, and for their time, you know, and for, I think, like from an editorial perspective, we have a unique pers a unique place in the realm because we have interesting content. Like we are connected with interesting people, and people are writing stories. It's not commercial. It's like you know, people that are out in the world and doing interesting things. So, but like we have a business side that's like cut the budget cut the budget did you did you need an original photo why didn't you just call this place to have them send you one you know and we're you know so we're advocating for like original photography and and like pushing the visuals and paying our photographers a decent rate when you know and i would never ask someone to do something for free you know but there's so many places that do that think like you know you it's free advertising or something but I will say, I have we do get free food. <laughs> so when the restaurant makes food, they we don't pay for that food. You know what I mean? Right. So like <laughs> stuff like that, you know, it's free. But you know, don't ask someone that's a professional to do something for free. Yeah, I saw a lot of a lot of that last year, just asking for free, and like, no, you know, it, it's just the the like the gall to ask. It's like. How dare you, especially during such a time as this or any other time. So you're going to ask me when I probably haven't worked all year for something for free. Like I would have I would have entertained if you offered something, even if it was something that was still offensive. But the point is, it's like <laughs> offer, you know, schmooze me first before you just say this will be exposure. And even then I'm like, it's probably not even good exposure or the exposure that I will um I can take advantage of. So by all means, no, um, just say no. Just like you say no to drugs, just say no to exposure because it's not gonna, it's not gonna do much for you. And you know, I, I will say this, there have, been, there, there have been times where I did take something for free, but it was under the, 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 um, the notice that the next thing would be a better opportunity. And it has. I'm, I think we have to be strategic with what we may say yes to and not receive any like monetary um, 
like comp uh, we're, what we receive compensation for. And I know some of y'all are like, oh, no, no, no. But I, I'm pretty sure some of you, maybe not all, but some of you have done something where it's just like, okay, maybe it's charity or maybe I see the next opportunity. And I've, and at least I've found success in saying, yes, I'll do it this time. And the next time you're going to have to like, we got to look out for each other. So I still say no, but it's totally up to you as to what you give your free time to. Make, just make it, make it worth it. Make it worth your time. I'm pretty sure everybody's going to say no, but yeah, you know, <laughs> just say no. <laughs> Not really. Like, like, <laughs> yeah, like where, where are you guys finding new photographers in your work? Gosh, great question. I mean, Instagram is huge, obviously. But a lot of times, like, I look at, like, cultural influencer people, not necessarily on Instagram, but I'll be like, oh, who, this rapper, who is shooting their photos, mm -hmm. or this, like, artist, who's that? You know, and then I'll, like, do a lot of research and just see who's out there, you know, and I find a lot of like young photographers that way or not even young but like emerging let's say mm -hmm. so i kind of think that there is like um a lot of people that collaborate with cultural figures i guess and you know that's kind of a good way to like find new people yeah it's a bit of osmosis i suppose it's like looking at all the photo press you know like the a photo editor or Mm -hmm. You know, just all the stuff that if you're in the photo business, you kind of just sort of poke around and look at stuff or, you know, there's lots of new um, resources that have popped up online, certainly around topics of diversity and hiring diverse set of photographers. So those are those websites are very helpful um, to find new people that you haven't worked with, that you're being conscious of like, OK, let me see who's out there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's like it's like osmosis. It's like all the places you go, whether it's the New York Times, or a photo editor, or you know, it's just other Instagram. Certainly, I don't know. <laughs> it's like it's just it's this constant sort of search of yeah. And I don't know, like uh, maybe those of us who are in the like the business of hiring photographers, it's like less conscious now. Like I almost am just like that's like sort of my. Yeah. Daily, like, like I just go to all the different places and I'm just looking and I'm like, okay, or, you know, I know some of us probably go to magazines, like mm -hmm. in the entertainment business, it's probably like Entertainment Weekly or, you know, mm -hmm. there's entertainment uh, websites and things like that. But I, I, I find work through all of those sources, but also photo books are a great way that I, that I find a lot of work. Um, you know, people send me things all the time or, you know, I, you know, follow various accounts. The occasional blog is still out there. They post about photo books. <laughs> Blogs yeah. are great. <laughs> uh, but I mean, Blogs the, are the, coming the, back. The big way that I, that I find a lot of work is actually through word of mouth. So I, I ask other photographers, like, you know, who do you like? Who, who, you know, who's out there that, you know, who are your colleagues, who are your friends that you're interested in, or other curators? And just, um, and also, like, who's good to work with? Like, you know, who do you, who do you like spending time with? Who's a good collaborator? Because the, the projects that I work on, they take a minimum of a year, you know, sometimes up to five years to come together. And you end up spending a lot of time <laughs> with that person. And if you don't like them as a person <laughs> or they're really difficult to work with, it is a brutal process. So it's, it's like a lot of it is about, you know, like, do they make good work and are they a good mm -hmm. person? And so a lot of that comes through um, through word of mouth and through, through you know, kind of like the, the networks. It's like, it's like hiring a plumber. You don't want to just hire somebody like, that no one else knows. You want to get one from a friend who's worked with them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 or, you know, or it's, or, or it's like dating. You want you want to yes. <laughs> you want to find out if you have chemistry with someone before you really make that commitment. Five star rating. Right? <laughs> yeah. Did you want, did you want to well, talk about that? Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, um, you know, uh, word of mouth, definitely, and also uh, networking with like counterparts. So I'll talk to other creative directors in town or you know, for other teams if I see stuff that they're 
producing interesting things, I'll ask them like, hey, who's the photographer that you worked with? So. I have to say, Matthew is really good at um, finding people. He, he emails <laughs> yes. me all the time. And back when we used to work at um, CNN together, he was like, you're so good at finding these mm -hmm. people I've never heard of, and it's amazing. I appreciate that about you. Um, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I don't know why I'm good at that. But uh, yeah, well, like, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's like literally like just kind of your daily thing, I think, as a photo editor, photo producer. You know, it's like you're constantly looking for new people. You constantly need new people. It's like, I, I, need, I need this job. I have this specific look or, you know, uh, And if you're a personal person, you're, you're obsessed with visual art. I'm always like, I'm always obsessed with the byline. If, you, if I see a billboard, mm -hmm. I gotta go figure out who shot that and like, then it's like how they light, how they light it or, you know, how come I don't know about them? And you know, what does it say about me? But, I think one thing too <laughs> to point out, like, I think, uh, Megan's here and John's here from from our photo team, but we have a team and we all do rely on each other and we all bounce ideas off each other. Like, oh, have you heard of this person? Do you know that? You know, who who do you know in? Yeah. Uh, like, we were talking about Las Vegas the other day. Do we have somebody in Las Vegas who who's good? You know, so there's always like a and it's usually sometimes like random places too. Like, we need somebody in Salt Lake City, Utah. Who's good there? You know? Or, well, I think that's fascinating to hear that sort of insight to the photographer sitting here. Who have never been in that position or may not even know that happened. So imagine mm -hmm. like the people talking about you and you don't know that. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so my point is that it's really like what Greg said, it's really important. Like, okay, you can take a good picture, that's amazing, but that's like that's like twenty five percent of like the, what goes into well, you know, I'd really say it's even ask. less. Yeah, I mean attitude is more than anything. Like you gotta like you say, you ha you gotta like the person because yeah. I've I've met plenty of photographer I'm just like mm-mm that's not it they like you're you're you are amazing but your attitude towards things eh, that's yeah. probably gonna like be like the the downfall of mm -hmm. who you are and you that's know? what that's what I think that's a great message and I think it's something that's not you know not you know you can't really put your finger on it so it's not taught it's not something you you know you kind of have to learn maybe through messing up a few times mm -hmm. or someone pulling you aside maybe a mentor or something so um, uh, that was a great point about like this being a relationship, and I know that with each of you, um, Lindsay too, it's like it's the relationship. The first thing you do is you got to get them to hire you that first time, mm -hmm. and then you got to get that you know next date and then the next mm -hmm. time, and, you know. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I guess um, one thing. You know, this is another. This is a COVID-specific question, but I'd love to hear if any of you have seen, um, absorbed over the past year and a half anything. Uh, any work that was a project maybe mm -hmm. that was specifically about the pandemic that really, really mm -hmm. moved you. It doesn't have to be anything you know, super like hard hitting or depressing, maybe it is, but um, I'd love to hear if like you discovered a project or uh, an artist through the pandemic, yeah. you know, through the work they're producing about the pandemic. Anybody? I did. Um, it's a guy out of, his family is out of Oklahoma. His name is um, Rahim Fortune. And he does a lot of um, medium format and eight by 10 work, but it was, it's, and I recently got his, his photo book, but it's very quiet work. He doesn't, it, there were, there was no text. It's just all images. And so you're flipping through and you, and it was, it was half COVID and half that his father um, had cancer. So it was like a mixture of work, but you're flipping through it and you're just like, that seems familiar. This could be any time. Is this COVID? Oh, that's definitely COVID. It's just like, it was so, just an amazing work that um, I don't think that I would have found or anybody else would have seen had it not been for um, the pandemic because we were all looking for something just kind of like to hold on to creatively. So and, um, that actually became one of like my, um, my pandemic habits, it's just a, by photo books because it keep it kept my mind rolling it kept my mind off of what was going on in the world too so i feel like that work right there um along with his girlfriend um her name is miranda barnes both of them are amazing emerging photographers and if you um are not familiar with them you're going to see more and more of their work so um both of them together they they're definitely a force so um they're the already knew miranda but um, I was not familiar with Raheem until 
um, started seeing more and more of his work during COVID. Mm -hmm. I just got that book. It's an amazing book. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. It's, mm, I, I like the fact that and along with, um, I don't have his book, and I don't think he has one yet, um, Dario Calmis. Um, just things that make you want to read, like more and more of things outside of photography. It just makes you want to think rather than process, you know, what the shot of things look like but process what was going on in their head as they were making the work. So that, I think those are, that's just a few. I have a lot more. I could sit here all day and talk, talk to you about it, but definitely Ryan Fortune, yeah, that, that's, that's a book I think everybody should, should definitely um, have, in their, uh, have in their library. So I, I think yeah. some, of the, some of the best work that I've seen is not necessarily about the pandemic mm -hmm. per se, but it's definitely like a result of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's like mm -hmm. about having, having this time to reflect and kind of you know, dig internally or to respond to everything that's going mm -hmm. on in the world where it's like it's not you know overtly about you know it's not, it's not just like pictures of people with masks or yeah, the know, obvious. yeah it's not, not, not the obvious signifiers of what the pandemic is, but kind of like what this last year plus has um, revealed to all of us about, you know, ourselves and our society. Um, and there's a couple of photographers who are coming to mind. And w one of them, this is a bit of shameless self-promotion, but Anmi Lay has been doing incredible work very quietly that's about, about the pandemic and about everything that has emerged from the pandemic. Um, she's actually working on a commission for the high, and she is based in New York, wasn't able to travel to the South to work on this commission, or to, to the Deep South at least, but spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. photographing the protests that happened around the White House um, in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And they're unlike any of the other pictures that you've seen of, of these protests. They're very, they're very quiet, they're contemplative. There are these in-between moments and kind of about how these expressions of political protests, but also you know, how the media or the political machine is trying to manage these different events and control the way that a message is delivered and trying to reveal how that process works in a, in a very quiet way. Um, and I, I think she just kind of like makes you stop and think about how, how all of these things come together. And another photographer I think has been doing great work, and it's in a, a totally different nature, is Carolyn Drake, who often works in you know, uh, a documentary uh, mode. Yeah, yeah she's, a, she's a member of Magnum. But she, she spent a lot of time in her backyard in Northern California, and every day would make a sculpture, just of the kind of materials that she had. And it totally changed her practice. You know, she would build a sculpture, and then she would photograph it, but she would also film herself making the sculpture. And inevitably, something would go wrong. Like, the wind would come through, it would fall apart. So it was about this, like, sense of precarity and unease uh, but it was about, like trying to find a way to be creative under circumstances that just don't foster creativity. And it was just amazing to see the way that she took this situation, which seemingly you know, stifled every way that she had of working and turned it into something really incredible and totally different from what she would have ever done before. Yeah, to, to that point, um, one thing I, I noticed, I saw happening several times is the pandemic and what was happening during the pandemic. Like I'm thinking about the um, Sixth Capital, um, specifically because I was following. Does anybody know Melvin Cole? Mm -hmm. uh, people like him, who uh, other people were like, sort of encouraged or to, to try something new with photography. Like he's not a he's this amazing hip hop photographer has a long career, and then something spurred him to almost start taking on the role of a journalist and he was out there in his own way, you know, doing stuff on Instagram and photographing. It, it, I felt like it kind of encouraged a lot of photographers to, um, to just step out of their comfort zone and try something completely new mm -hmm. because a lot of people weren't working or like there was just, I don't know. But I'm specifically thinking of Melody Cole's work because it was just so different and incredibly moving. He was, sh you know, the, the best thing about photography was he was, sh he was there with a thousand other photographers. Mm -hmm. you know? And his perspective is so uniquely different. That's what's amazing about what we do. You can line all of us up, point our camera to something, and it's completely different. But um, like, like your, your, to your point, Craig, about the pandemic, it really it flipped a switch for a lot of us on the inside, and it sort of channeled out through the work we were making. So that's why I wanted to ask you guys about um, COVID-specific work or things that were generated from it. I know a lot of artists were at the 
beginning were like, oh, I gotta, I gotta create, I gotta do something, and then a lot of people were like, oh, this is really depressing. And um, yeah, it was it was a roller coaster. Um, uh, I just want to also, while I have the mic and turn it on, say thank you to people like Martha and, and Matthew and, and Gregory and some for for being the advocate for people like me and Lindsay and all the other photographers here because um, it's yeah, it's just. I mean, I don't think we can ever thank you guys enough yeah. for the what you do on the other side that we often don't see. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, yeah, it's really you know, it's it's how we. One thing I did want to ask you guys, uh, going back to when we were talking about promotion, is the best way to stay in touch. I don't want to phrase it this way, but the best way to stay in touch, because I know a lot of photographers struggle. I struggle with that, like, like how to how to stay in touch without being annoying. How often? Yeah, and how often, like, you know, hey, it's me, ah, I'm Like quarterly, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've heard. <laughs> or, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, quarterly is good, biannually. <laughs> um, but I, th I mean, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's also about, you know, your, your expectations and just, you know, not always expecting. Like I, like, I love getting the update. I love, like, here's a link to the new work that I've been working yeah. on. Um, but just not expecting like a you know full thought out critique of the work that you're doing every single time. Mm -hmm. But just be like I like I love knowing what's going on. I want like I want to have, you know I want to have the work on my radar. Like I can't do my job without photographers either. Yeah. Um, so it's it's valuable to me to stay to stay informed. But I think it's just you know what are you expecting <laughs> in in return? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, and all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of it's it's somewhat taboo to come out and and admit that. But I, you know, particularly in museums, like we're all we're all struggling with the you know appalling lack of diversity that our institutions you know have exhibited and collected, and we're we're reckoning with that. And we're coming to terms with that. But at the same time, like we're, we're like we're actively seeking out photographers of color. We're actively seeking out queer photographers or female photographers. But it's you know, you can't always come out and say that because then it seems like you know you're you're pandering in one way or another. But um, it's something that you know all the time. Like we're like we know where we failed, <laughs> and we want to and we want to do we want to do better. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely always looking for um, all kinds of photographers, and I honestly think of it almost like matchmaking like you know I'm not gonna say like I think of it as like I want the person that's photographing the community I'm sending them to to be invested in that community and to be knowledgeable about it and to you know be connected to it so like I'm in the same way I like in rural Georgia you know I'm not gonna necessarily send one kind of photographer I'm gonna send someone I think that understands and has empathy, empathy for the people that they're photographing. And I think that um, I'm always trying, like I'm not gonna send a straight white dude to like the Queer Pride Fest, you know, I'm just not. Like, 
And so I'm going to find someone that's queer that has an interesting perspective. And I think that like in any, in any way that you can engage with the people you're photographing that you can be a collaborator, not like taking a photo, but making a photo mm -hmm. and like collaborating with the people that you're photographing and being connected to that community, then that's better. And I think that's how it should be. And not like this kind of like, you know, just, I don't know how to describe it, but like just fly on the wall. Oh, I'm just going to like jump into this community for a day and then leave, you know? And I think that good photographers can do that, but I think that it's more powerful when it's someone that's connected to the community. I have no say so in that. I don't hire. So, um, <laughs> I mean, if I, if I did, I would, you know, definitely be, um, mindful as to who I'm asking to ensure that whatever work I've seen them do, that it fits whatever story that I'm potentially, potentially putting them on. Um, you know, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. So understanding that, um, the, that there are oftentimes white photographers that are, are described as being parachuting into a place just because and then leaving. So it feels like you're taking rather than giving back to the community that you actually photograph. So, you know, thinking about the perspectives of, of the, the very, of the nature of the people that you're photographing is important. And I know that it, it can seem a bit convoluted at times, but just if you think about all the protests that happened last year, and you think about the representation of press that was in the area or press that was coming to Atlanta or going to Minneapolis and not being representative of the area that they were photographing, it, it, it definitely, um, it, it hit a nerve for a lot of us. So um, I'll give you a prime example. Um, the unfortunate death of um, Rashard Brooks, um, I wasn't looking to be hired for any of, of that type of work just because of the nature of it. It's just like, I'm already in my feelings about it. I'm just, I'm just here in support. But I did make it a point to look at the media and it was all white. So if you think about that as far as like how to give um, um, a reputable headline for a story or a reputable uh, perspective of the story, you only had one view. And that's not to say that um, they felt as if Rayshard Brooks is at fault, but psychologically we probably thought that all of the white media that was there or just national media that had white representation didn't really have any other things to say. Am I making sense to you all? Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> so yes, I would definitely put people who fit a particular community in the space where I know that first you've probably been briefed on the, um, the um, situation, but you also have like this heart-centered part of you that says, you know, I'm already in a very precious place and I'm gonna treat that story as precious as it is. Yeah. Man, what a topic. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's good. I, 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 I knew we would go here. Um, <laughs> the short answer to your question is yes, but of course it's a very complex mm -hmm. um, thought process for people that are hiring and it's a process I think in general. And I definitely agree with everybody who's gone before me on all the points. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a lot, uh, you know, well, let me organize my thoughts here. I think there's, yes, I mean, I think you need to be very conscious of how you're assigning something. Um, I don't necessarily always, I don't know, like I was having this conversation with a photographer the other day who is an older white photographer and he brought up some points that were interesting about women being hired because they're women and being told to their face that they're being hired because they are women. So I'm interested in hearing actually some of those um, perspectives from a woman or from somebody who's hired because they are something. It'd be interesting to hear that side of it. So I think as, as an assigner, as a high art buyer, whatever, um, it's a complex thing and I don't know if always the answer is to be super rigid about your assigning and like okay I'm, we're gonna this assignment is a 
in my in our instance a, a black cast on a on a TV show so we're going to hire a black photographer sometimes that might really work sometimes maybe not you know it's 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 about more than that you know it's like you know it's about the person you're hiring who they are you know their skills what they're bringing to the assignment it's not just about how they identify, what they look like, do they match in those ways? Do they match from a skills perspective? Do they match from a heart perspective? You know, what do they bring into it that is that, that thing that isn't surface, you know, or an identifier or whatever? So I think that's, it's a really, this is a question and a topic that we all gotta talk lots more about. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a good topic, but it's a complex one, you know, cause you're, like you say, it's about age too. So I was talking to this, you know, older white photographer who feels maybe like a bit under threat because they're older. You know, there's a lot of age related stuff as well. Um, so it's just, yeah, I think we've all got to be much more conscious about that stuff and think about it way more. Luckily, we do sometimes make decisions that are at least the beginning of the conversation is should, you know, how do we assign this? Is it best to go to a black photographer, or a queer photographer, or whatever? Um, but the the end result doesn't always end in that. You know what I'm saying? So if there's a lot of conversation, and luckily our group and the people that I'm learning from, and we do have those conversations, and we don't look at it as this one zero kind of thing. It's much more nuanced than that, and so. That, that's such a. That's such a great answer, okay. Matthew. That's, <laughs> well, and, and then ev everybody's insight is so spot on that I feel like I really don't have anything else to add. I mean, for me, um, in sports, um, I, w I would love to hire a photographer that represents the athletes that we shoot, mm -hmm. but um, because you know that there's gonna be more of a connection when they see the person behind the camera that looks like them, right? But it's it's challenging sometimes, and I, I you know, and this past couple of years has been a, like an eye-opening experience for me because I I realized that I do have to make sure that the photographers, illustrators, designers that I hire um, are like represent more than myself or who I think of as 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 a creative person, right? So. Um, it's something that I've learned and I'm definitely making more of an effort. Um, but it, like everybody was saying, it's not a cut and dry, it's a formula, there's not a formula for it. It's, uh, it, it we all have to do our best and make sure that, um, you know, it's, it's fair, but also like we are, it, it is representative, the people that we're hiring. Mm -hmm. I will say too, just um, that it's, so good that all of this conversation has happened because personally for me I've, I've just discovered a lot more photographers that weren't on my radar you know so it's just like man there's like all these talented people that i wasn't necessarily paying attention to mm -hmm. and they're amazing and they deserve to be paid attention to um so for me anyway it's uh, you know i can only speak for myself in that perspective but it's just it's been like this door opening of going okay wow there's so much more out there <laughs> and that's a good thing for me as a photo editor and a hire and somebody who's hiring photographers because i've just got so many more options <laughs> and it's good for all those people who are creators and not just you know not just those specific people but for the whole community, for the whole creative community, it's good to have all of these doors kicked open f for a more diverse set of people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I absolutely love your question. And, and as someone who is on a platform that has helped 700 photographers with their careers and, and now with a more uh, distinct roster, we actually do get a lot of people who email us and say, hey, I'm just going to come out flat say it. I'm looking for a black photographer. I'm looking for a queer photographer.
Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.
um, but maybe it's not. And maybe one that you want to adopt. Maybe. Right. Uh, so. <laughs> but, um, how did you get where you are, and what were the steps? Did you have a mentor? Was it something you kind of just kept pushing, your confidence kept growing, so you saw it in you? Tell me about your experience, please. <laughs> Wait, you start. I have to start? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't like being put on the spot. Um, yeah, it is, it, is a, it is a lot of work. I mean, finding a mentor is a hugely important part of it. Um, but it's, you know, it's a matter of being persistent, being hungry, kind of like looking out for the people who are doing the things that you want to do and working up the courage to ask that question that you just asked and then say, like, can we get coffee and really pick your brain and then sticking to it and trying to find, you know, the, like your own way through it. I mean, I, there's, I mean, as a, as a museum curator, there's no, there's no playbook about how to, how to do it. Like I started out as a, you know, as a photographer, I have a BFA in photography and I thought I was going to be, you know, working photographer and that just was not the path for me, but I discovered museum work and it just opened up all of these different possibilities of being able to work with photography in a, in a different way. And it was a long process of taking those uh, unglamorous low level jobs in museums simply for the opportunity to watch someone else do the job that I wanted to do and learn those subtle ways that you, you conduct yourself. How do you interact with people? You know, what are, the, what are the things that you're never going to read in a book or no one's ever going to tell you in an interview? And just being in the room watching how they navigate a certain situation. Um, and it, it's, it, takes a while <laughs> it takes a while. You know, I've, I've, um, I've, I've been working in museums for 15 years now. And I've done everything from you know sitting at the front desk and shelving books in the library to you know, curating the shows and giving the talk you know that you know you know opens opens the exhibition and you are going to have to be willing to take all of those bumps along the way because you know it's it's good experience and you don't always do it for free but <laughs> 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 I did a lot of things for free <laughs> for free um, and you know I I learned a lot and I think that's kind of kind of made me appreciate kind of like how what it takes to really to really do the job and do it and do it well. But if you want to be a curator, I'll give you my card. <laughs> we'll, t we'll, t we'll, t we'll talk, and I can, I can, uh, I can give you <laughs> some, some, some tips there. But I don't, I don't recommend it. It's not a particularly lucrative career. <laughs> um, I think uh, also just for me, a lot of my career was luck, you know, and I wish I could say like I'm extremely talented and I've got all these skills that no one else does, but the, really I just happened to be at the right place at the right time and got a job that gave me experience that got me the next job that gave me experience that got me the next job, you know, and like I think a lot of people could probably do my job if they had 15 years of experience doing what I did, you know. So, um, but I think I'm also like not a good enough photographer to be a photographer. So that's kind of like every photo editor is like, I wish I could be a better photographer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and I think honestly, like what Ray was saying earlier is just being nice and easy to work with and respectful of people and their time and, you know, that's a big part of anything. Oh, me, okay. Well, I mean, I thought you were one of the editors, but I'll answer <laughs> your question. I've only had two jobs in my adult career. I was an adjunct professor. Um, I taught public, public speaking and photography, and I did all of those things um, simultaneously. So there were times where I, was, I may have taken off of work to take a job, I just took a lot of chances, quite honestly. Um, mentorship was um, different for me because uh, I did not have any. So it was more of a, you know, test it, see if it works, and then move to the next thing. Um, but I, I, I'm grateful that, you know, there were people that did step up and say, hey, um, I want to help you out because, you know, my, I started off as a portrait and wedding photographer and then slowly transitioned into doing um, photojournalism, editorial, and commercial work. And it just, I think once you've, you've had enough 
of that type of work, you know, no shade to those that, that do it now, you realize um, not only do you make more money, but it's less stress. So if anything, I would say definitely, you know, finding mentorship will probably be easier now just because people are trying to just be more helpful to um, guide you in the way that you want to go. Um, and if anything, um, I've found success and I've, I've, I've pulled some other people in with me. It's just a kind of shadow. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's always good to let somebody in the door to see what they can do as well. Um, because for one, it's already, uh, it's a hard world to get into when it comes to the, the, the commercial side. And, you know, you may think you want to get in it, but you don't necessarily want to do it all of the time. So mentorship, um, definitely reaching out to, to those that you feel like you want your career to emulate. And, um, yeah, I, I, I don't see anything wrong with doing either one of those things. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, so I don't know if I've, I think maybe I've had less than five people ever tell me they wanted to be a photo editor. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a kind of like, I don't even know if most people know what a photo editor is. You know, it's one of those just really strange jobs that, you know, it's like, and maybe I'm making too much of it, but, um, you, you know, just get I get up right by this random person and say, hey, can you do this thing? That's what you all do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's kind of that weird. Is. It is. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, I think, you know, I guess my point of saying that was that if there's people that you're interested in meeting or they might be more flattered and more um, sort of, you know, take more notice of you than you think because they probably haven't been approached that many times <laughs> to say, oh, like, any, anytime somebody takes interest in what, you know, you know, like you take interest in somebody else and what they do, they're probably going to take notice and they're probably going to be flattered and they're probably going to want to go, oh, well, yeah, sure, I'd love to talk about myself. Um, <laughs> but especially, I think, with photo editors, because I don't, I don't know if there's really, I mean, I know photo editors at magazines and... I, me less so and maybe my colleagues I don't know but we don't get really approached even by that many photographers per se we live we we operate in a very niche uh industry where everybody sort of knows each other um you know there's a set sort of path we all travel professionally and network and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um so you you might catch somebody off guard in a really good way by approaching them and saying, hey, I, you know, I like what you do. I'm interested in doing that same thing. Would you be interested in having a conversation with me? I think you might get pretty far with that. It, I mean, you know, I could be wrong. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I might be a softie as well. I mean, you get far with me, but anyway. I think for me, um, it was just, I don't know. I, got, I kind of fell into this job as creative director for the Braves out of, I think you mentioned luck earlier. Luck was mentioned earlier. It's just being being in the right place at the right time, um, and just a lot of hard work. Um, and um, you know, as I was moving up in in design and creative, um, even the small projects, I put like so much effort into it mm -hmm. um, because I just wanted. I was like driven to make sure that even if it was a small little sign for a concession stand, I wanted it to look amazing. And I wanted a baseball fan to see that and go, wow, that's really cool that somebody put so much energy and thought into that. Um, and eventually, when you when you put yourself out there like that, someone's going to notice that and, and they're going to see, oh, wow, this is like, this is somebody who really cares and who, um, you know, is putting so much energy into something that's so small that they're gonna put that sort of effort and energy into something bigger. So you get trusted, you you know, you get more and more trust and responsibility, and just kind of grows from there. I grabbed this microphone because apparently oh. this other microphone is not going to the live stream all night. So. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for your answers. Those those have been. Um, Amazing, seriously, it's good stuff, really good stuff. Um, we're gonna have to wind down, so we got time for like one, maybe two, if it's a quickie. Questions? Yep, yeah. yeah, we got a hot mic. 
And then we are going to transition into giving a bag away. So don't go anywhere. All right, you ready? You got to come all the way up here. All right. You have to. Um, my name is Joe. Um, I'm a recent college grad. I just moved out here from Virginia. Oh, um, nice. So I did uh, MFA, so graphic design and photography. So my question is for Lindsay first. So like, how did you go about like imposter syndrome? So like, knowing that people were kind of pandering to it, even though the work was still solid, it was just kind of like, how did you navigate through that? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Yeah. And then um, that's the second question would be like, as far as like networking now what does that look like for like a photographer that wants to get into the game and like for photographers that hire or people that hire photographers how do you go about like hiring like an assistant because i know like i would love to do that but i just don't know how to get into the space mm -hmm. but not not be like weird awesome can you tell me your name one more time uh, joel. Joel. joel okay um so joel as far as imposter syndrome um it, it hit several times because it, it's, just gonna say it. I know that I'm good, <laughs> but it's another thing to feel like I'm only being seen for who I am rather than my talent. And, you know, before um, May 2020, um, I was already working for like a handful of people that I, you know, I really enjoyed and it only progressed more after but even with that, again, it just felt like, yay, here I am, black queer girl on the move, you know? But at the same time, like, what else do you see? Because I just wanted somebody to see me more than that. Like, look, look at all the stuff that I've done before we got to George Floyd, or look at all the other stuff that I did before we even got to 2020. Like, what about that stuff? That stuff matters just as much as you are. It, 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 to me, it matters more than the work that you're giving me now. It's just only um, like name recognition now at this point. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to keep a straight answer for you. Uh, but imposter syndrome sometimes still hits now because um, it's, it's just like getting your dream jobs, but also still having it in the back of your head. Like, I know I, I did that. Like, I, I crushed that shoot, but it's like right here. Like, hmm, am I? Am I being the, the black person in the room without actually being there? Am I being your queer representative without actually saying anything about it? Like. You see who I am every day, but if you didn't see who I was, would my work still matter? And that's what I sometimes have on my mind. You know, it doesn't come as often as it did as before, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly walking into who I am. I'm slowly walking into the creative that I feel like I've grown to be and that I've worked hard to do as well. Um, to answer your second question, as far as networking, you're already doing it you're here with other photographers. And I feel like when we all connect, then we, you know, we are, we are a force. You know, even connecting on Instagram, there's a lot of you I've seen on Instagram and it feels weird to see you in person. <laughs> so, so knowing that, and to be real with you, Joel, Atlanta has a very well-connected photo community. We are here to help each other out. So when you're in moments like this and when you reach out to other photographers that, that you may know right here in the city, we are welcoming. You know, of course, you know, uh, us being uh, in the South, which is very, we want to hold on to you too and look out for you. So this is networking. This is a place that you can find one or two or maybe five more friends that's going to help you, you know, get you started. Maybe it may not be straight up photography. You may be an assistant. You may learn that you like assisting more than being a photographer. You may learn, you may um, understand that you like being a, digi a digital tech more than being a photographer. But either way, that puts you in places with other people that you can continuously network with. So that would be the way that I say to kind of start here, and especially with things starting to open up in the world, and especially you know, right here in the city. Connect with these folks that's right here, and then you're pretty much connected to what's going on in the creative world in Atlanta. Yeah. 
<laughs> Thank you. Public speaking for Thanks for that answer. That was that was amazing. Thank you. Um, did I answer your question, Joel? Yes, yeah, you're in the right place. This is it. Yeah, that's great. Um, they found us. So I, I guess I just want to. Oh, we have another. Yeah. Oh, yes. She doesn't have a question. <laughs> Diversion. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we're losing light with the live stream. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, you guys don't have to leave, but uh, I want to just thank all the, the panelists for coming. Thank all of you guys Woo. for coming. It's a really big deal for us. Five years. Right. Right. Uh, right. The pandemics. You know, winding down. So I don't want to say it's over, but we're here. So um, again, thanks to our sponsors, KEH, um, PPR for providing the chairs and Think Tank. We're gonna. I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin, and we're gonna give away some shit. Yep. All right. So first off, I want to tell the live streaming viewers, all ten of you, to. <laughs> so we know who you are. You have to make a comment right now, and we're gonna pick randomly. It's gonna be done very strategically. It's, it's very scientific. <laughs> Who's going to win that bag? So you have to comment now, right? <laughs> <laughs> this was John's idea. All right. So. Oh, it's. It's all right. All right. Man. All right. Well, we're going to figure that out. But we're going to give away a bag now. Well, we don't have the bag. I think Think's going to mail it to you. So we have a very sophisticated process. We're going to put names in a hat. We're going to draw a hat. So. They're going to write them down. <laughs> We're going to write them down. Okay. okay. Make sure. Yeah, yeah, right. Write we can do that real quick. So just write you your name down. If you guys want to enter the contest, just come right over here and put your name uh, on a piece of paper and put it in Kevin's hat. And we're going to draw right now. How does that? It's very scientific. You ready? All right. You ready? we got to do it. All right. I see one person. Yep. One, two, three, go. Yep. Can you do it? All right. Here, hold this. Is that it? Awesome. Awesome. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Five, years. Five years. Thanks, everybody.